Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I wanna encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. Take out the papers and the trash. Or you don't get no spending cash. If you don't scrub that kitchen floor, you ain't gonna rock and roll no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go back. Just finish cleaning up your room. Let's see that dust fly with that broom. I started out with saying uh, they're taking out the trash as I'm walking up, and I thought, taking out the trash? I just got here. <laughs> you know, I'd like to meet Jeff's parents because Jeff's parents, man, they cover a lot of what I'm going to cover today. And they modeled and they uh, did some things that I think all of us hope to emulate as time goes on in our life. Speaking to you from Ephesians 6, 1 uh, through 4. And by the way, my name is Jonathan Morgan. I have a son who hangs around this place, and uh, you may be aware of him. He preaches occasionally here. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here today, some, spend some time with you, and to share with you some of the experiences that I had. And, Many of my experiences have been uh, very positive, but I've had some painful ones that I've made some mistakes in parenting, and I wish now that I could go back and redo those things. But, uh, you know, the wonderful thing about God is you get second chances. And all of us, I know, are grateful for that, to get an opportunity to, to do it over again. And... Um, you never can replace the first time, but boy, it's so nice to know that God gives us opportunities to, to, to redeem some of the things that took place in the past. The title of the sermon today is, Lord, help me help my children. Any of you that had children realize that, boy, what you thought you might have known beforehand, phew, vastly different from once you have children. It's easy when you look at somebody else as a single person and you look at them and their children seem to be unruly. You think, boy, they need to do this and this and this and this. Well, if I had kids, I'd do that. Then your kids come along, you know, and you go, oh, my goodness, I need help. <laughs> well, let's look at this passage, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, oh, you obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger or to wrath, as some versions say, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I want to 
share with you um, today some things that, um, that were shared last week because we're really dealing with the same passage. But I want to go and talk about some things that Jeff and his wife talked about this morning when they talked about how do you deal with children now that they've left the home? And how do you deal with children who no longer walk with the Lord? And that's difficult. But there's some wonderful truths that will help us. And I hope to share some of those with you today. This whole chapter is about soldier in chapter six. A a church is a soldier and it has relationships, a soldier's enemy, his protection, his example. We find that Paul was a good soldier of Christ. As a soldier of Christ, the first lesson they must learn is obedience to authority. If you don't get that, you're in real trouble as a soldier. He must learn how to follow orders. Home is the basic training where soldiering occurs, if you will, for children as well as adults. As a, as a soldier has to learn to obey the, and gets promoted. And if he does that and does it well, then his rank will go up. And to know who to give orders depends on largely on how you, how you soldier and how you learn to obey yourself. If you don't learn how to obey, it's difficult to help those who are under you. Basic training is found in the home with a parent-child relationship. And then as we go further in this chapter, in the, in the master-servant relationship, the victories of the Christian life are won in the home and in the place of business. It's a wonderful thing that God is in charge, and he places people all over, the, all over Bakersfield and all over the United States, all over the world, who will be able to tell other people about Jesus and not confine them to a little small place like the early disciples all in Jerusalem until persecution came and they spread all over the place and the gospel went everywhere. We must assume that Paul was talking about a Christian home since this chapter follows chapter five about the marriage relationship. And obedience of children to parents is confined to the circumference of in the Lord. Christians' parents have the privilege of claiming their children for the Lord And I think we all should do that as Christians. The Bible says, lo, children are the heritage of the Lord, that he gives us for a period of time, and then they're gone. But they belong to him, and he gives us the opportunity to train him. You know, I I really believe, and some of you will probably agree with me, one of the reasons God gives us children is to help the adults grow up. (laughs) Some of you know what I'm talking about. All right. It certainly caused me to grow up. And I was a selfish, prideful, arrogant little guy who thought he, thought he knew something. But boy, when I had children, man, I was placed into a Christian school to teach when I came out of college. And uh, it seemed like every time I opened my mouth and I said something for the kids, I was get this tap, tap, tap from the Holy Spirit. Ooh, that was good. Now tell yourself. Mm. I learned, I think, more in that five years teaching in that Christian school here in Bakersville than I learned probably in 15, 20 years. God taught me so much about myself and how I respond. Well, we know that disobedience is one of the galling sins of the last days. And 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 2 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. Do we see some of that today? Oof. I went into many homes as a pastor. I've probably been in over a thousand homes. When people used to go out and visit, <laughs> pastors used to go to homes and visit and knock on doors, and I've probably been in a thousand homes. And um, boy, some things I saw in those homes, and I thought, wow, somebody needs to help the parents in helping their children. Paul addresses children and fathers primarily about discipline and instruction. And I want to share some things. If you weren't here last week, share some things that were uh, shared last week and, and then uh, go on and share some things about what we can do as we think about children who've left the home, especially those who no longer follow the Lord. From last week, statistically, those children in homes that experience these kind of following traits that I'm going to talk about fare better than other children. It's important today because 50% of adult children still live with their parents. This is coming from last week. 
Statistically, those children in homes learn responsibility to do chores, to develop social skills, learn healthy relationships. They're rewarded for their effort. Parents are more authoritarian than passive. Children are, <laughs> children are not your friends. When he said that, I laughed last week. I struggled in my, when I was first teaching, and I just couldn't seem to get, I couldn't get these kids to obey me like they did to some of the other adults, and I just couldn't get it. And finally, one lady took me aside and said, Jonathan, she said, if you're going to be effective, you've got to learn one thing. They are not your friends. You're here to teach them. Oh, it really helped me when she told me that. I tried to be nice to all of them, you know, and to be this and placate them and all that other stuff, you know, because I was their friend. And that didn't work. In the home, they're taught grit. They're taught how to, to let them fail. They're taught self-control and that parents paid attention to them when they're in the home. So that's the statistics. Teach them to love Jesus is the second thing, to be competent and independent, to model, as Jeff just said, they model Christ in front of them. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 1, therefore be imitators of God and walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. As they watch you, they emulate their, your behavior. That's the way a lot of learning takes place. You look at pro athletes. How many young people want to emulate one of the stars? And they copy you all of his moves, and they look at them, oh, they study this and that, and they're, that's their idol, and they want to do everything he can do. Well, children copy us. Spiritually speaking, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. I want to get practical with you this morning. I love the story of the little boy. He was eight years old and he had a um, friend who lived next door. She was a 11 year old girl and he thought, well, she probably knows something about mothers. And he said, I'm going to ask her something about Mother's Day. I want to, I want to, I want to go next door and I wanted to, um, I, I just, um, I'm going to ask her, what would my mother really like for Mother's Day? And the little girl said to him, well, that's easy. You could promise to keep your room clean and orderly. You could go to bed as soon as she tells you. You could, you could go see her when she calls you instead of making her call four or five times. You could brush your teeth after eating. And she says you could stop fighting with your brothers and sisters. And he goes, he had a look of consternation on his face. And he goes, whoa, wait, wait. He goes, look. He said, I want something practical. <laughs> You know, problem with good advice, it usually interrupts our plans, you know. <laughs> From last week, we looked about, talked about some things about parents must not be unreasonable, must not be fault finding. To be able to, instead of looking for faults, be able to look for something you can con commend them for. N number three from last week was neglect, just not spending time with them and then inconsistency in walk. So there's some things that we covered last week. Well, how do you honor your parents? By obeying the authority that God has placed there. The Bible gives us three authorities, the home, the church, and government. There are different roles, different spheres of influence, but they are ordained by God. In the home, children need to learn how to accept their parents, the good, the bad, realizing that God gave them to them. You may hear a child says, yeah, but you know, I didn't get a choice. Then the parents could say, well, neither did I. <laughs> we need to learn to accept what God gave us. Amen. And be grateful for it. Respect parents. Respect means that we learn how to forgive them for their weaknesses and their faults. Children need to learn that also. Well, it's true that adults need to learn it, but children need to learn how to do it. Remember to give, they're going to need forgiveness too in their own lives, and they're not perfect. So they need to learn how to forgive their parents when they see imperfections in them. But we honor them by the way we talk to them. As I said, I've been in so many homes, and I've listened to children talk to the parents, and I want to get up and wring their neck. 
how they talk to the parents so shamefully, so brass and just ugly. I realize the parents allowed it, you know, but nevertheless, it's sometimes really difficult to listen to par- children talk to parents the way they do. Now, I've been in homes where there's some wonderful, beautiful kids. So I don't want to make it sound like that I've been in really all these bad homes. But we honor them by listening to them. Here's a verse that means a great deal to me. It uh, was a verse that when I read it, because I wasn't a very o- obedient uh, child, and uh, we were very, very strict in our home. We got at the breakfast table at 5.30 in the morning, eight of us. Mom got up at 5.00. We all had to play an instrument before we went to school, so I played the violin. Unfortunately, I got stuck with two instruments, the violin and the piano. And so uh, we had Bible memory drills every night. And we went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and any of the associational, associational meetings. And boy, we were very structured in our house. And in time, I just rebelled against that, and uh, I didn't listen. I read this verse, and... I now had a child or two, and when I read this verse, tears just tears just ran down my face. It says in Proverbs nine, eight and nine, do not reprove a scoffer, a scoffer, he will hate you. Re- reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet the wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. Well, that wasn't me. And I had some children, and I thought, wow, how am I going to teach them when I don't know it myself? How can I model that if I don't know it myself? Children want a place of life. I mean, a place of a place of peace and stability. They'd like to have their have good self esteem, and and if they do that in time, and they learn how to obey their parents, even when their parents are wrong, they'll turn out well. The parents are going to make mistakes. So for you young people, listen. You may see, hey, well, they they're not perfect, and they're not but they're still given to you by God for you to to obey. They're going to make some mistakes, but they're in charge. You're going to make some mistakes. Good thing God is gracious. You remember in the Bible, a man named Samson? Samson was uh, a guy that nobody could touch. He went everywhere he wanted to go. He did whatever he wanted to do, and nobody could say anything about it because nobody could do anything about it. He was just used by God to be a... (laughs) really to subdue God's enemies. And if he would have been obedient to God and to his parents, because they told him a number of times, listen, you're going with the wrong women. And he didn't listen. And in time, one of those women enticed him to give up his secret about his strength. And they captured him and put out his eyes and paraded him around and around in a circle for all these people to see. And they went as a big stadium that day, honoring the God, um, Dragon, a Dagon, and um, while they were doing so, Samson's hair had grown back, and he asked the young boy who was leading him around to put him between the two pillars, and as you know the story, he asked God to one more time to give him strength, and he pushed those pillars apart, and he killed more people in his death than he did while he was alive. But he was a judge, and he would have been a judge for 40 years. As it turned out, he was only a judge for 20 because he was disobedient. You remember Absalom, David's son? One of the most handsome men in in all of the kingdom and had hair. I meant to look it up. His hair weighed somewhere between three and and five pounds, and then he'd have it cut off. It weighed so much. And he was so proud of his hair, and and he was very disobedient and did some things that were wrong. And in time, he died, and then... And his hair was his downfall. He got it stuck in a tree and couldn't get out. Can you imagine that in the limbs and the thicket? He couldn't get out, and one of David's soldiers killed him. But he was disobedient. Could have lived a long time, but he lost his life. It's been estimated that over 50% of fathers now are not in the home. 
And it's also estimated that within 10 years or so, there'll be 60% of fathers will be absentees left to single moms and rain the children. In some cultures today, it's already over 70% absentee fathers. And even when the father's there, sometimes mentally he's not. You ever gone home from a hard day of work and there's kids and they want attention and you're just not, you're not there. Leave me alone. Don't bother me. And a lot of times fathers are not there mentally. They're home. They're sitting there. But they're not home. Well, let's look at some ways, some practical ways <laughs> to deal with children when they've left the home. Even wayward children. Number one, continue to set a godly example. Love your spouse sac- sacrificially. Find ways to show him or her that you love them. Be as creative and as spontaneous as you like. There are many different ways to do that. Your children need to know that you love your spouse and that there's the most precious gift to you. Remember, they're going to emulate you. And what they see in you and your spouse is what they're going to emulate. That's what they're going to copy. It'll give them great stability to watch God to behavior in action. And of course, we need God's help to do it because we have so many weaknesses and we want to in spirit, but the flesh just lets us down. I've shared with you before, how many of you found out the flesh is pathetically weak and it just lets us down over and over and over again to the point that sometimes we just want to do something to ourselves, you know, like... Martin Luther used to do, he wanted to be so righteous. He's a Roman Catholic priest and he tried and, and he climbed the stairs on his knees and climbed that a hundred stairs or so and bloodied himself up and he used to take a, a whip and he would just beat himself till he passed out trying to knock the sin out of himself till he found out that the just shall live by faith and it changed his whole life. Have you felt like sometimes you just want to hit yourself for doing something stupid and you've done it again and again and again and again and you want to stop? It's a good thing God's gracious, amen, and merciful. Because there's things right now, you may be a Christian five years, you may be one for 25 years, but you still have some things that gnaw at you, that you wish they weren't that way and you'd like to change those. You're working on it, but you're just not there yet. How many times have you forgotten to do something or you did something you weren't supposed to do or you said something that you now regret and yet God blessed you in spite of it? That's how gracious God is. Amen. Be grateful. Be grateful for the gift of your spouse. It's difficult today because we live in a society that compares everything. Clothes, cars, grade point average, homes, incomes, you name it, abilities of all kinds, speaking ability or athletic ability or this ability, whatever it may be, people compare themselves. And then they look at this person over that person and go, wow, how did I end up with this person? I could have been with that one. Compare some again. Remember, if it's for a man, she's the one God gave you. Tell her you love her and vice versa. Wife for the man. Never give your wife an occasion to doubt your love or occasion for jealousy or lack of trust. Over the years, I've done a lot of counseling and <laughs> I've counseled people and I, I am amazed sometimes at what people do. I just, I, I can't fathom that people do this. Uh, counseling with a couple, both of them, they want to say ex-alcoholics, but in a fit of oh, a spat that they had, he texted her this picture of a, of a big bottle of vodka with some martinis. He says, I'm going to drink this big bottle of vodka tonight, and if I commit suicide, I want you to know it's your fault. Now, how'd you like to pass that along to your wife that you love? <laughs> Another man told me in counseling, he said, she's done this and this and this, so this weekend I've got two girls lined up. I'm going to choose one of them to sleep with. I looked at him, I go... <laughs> This is the kind of stuff people do. And I was like, my goodness. If you love your spouse, you're not going to entertain those thoughts. Here's some good advice. Continue to love your spouse continually and unconditionally. 
Jeff mentioned that this morning. Praise God. Be genuine. Be genuine. Secondly, not only continue to love your spouse continually and unconditionally, ask forgiveness for your spouse. We're going to get to children in a minute. As parents, we're all weak in certain areas. God gives us a spouse that's hopefully strong in the areas where we're weak. But why is it so difficult to ask for forgiveness? Here's the big problem. Pride. The big problem. It raises its ugly head time and time again. Why can't we just simply say this? You know, yesterday when you, when we were engaged in conversation, I responded very badly to you. I'm really sorry for what I said. Will you forgive me? Why is that so hard to say when it's so needed? A lot of things could be solved if we would just be willing to say, I responded poorly. I said such and such. That was wrong. I'm sorry for what I did. Will you forgive me? We need to do that same time sometimes to our children. We responded badly to them because we got, we got angry and we need to go and apologize for letting the anger rule us when we did whatever we did and that followed. We're not perfect. Here's what the devil tells us all the time, especially with children. That ungrateful brat, they ought to come and apologize to me rather than me bowing down and apologizing to them. That's what the devil says. And unfortunately, we believe it a lot of times. That's right. They should come apologize to me for their behavior. I do this and for them. I, I pay the, for the car. I pay for the insurance. I pay for the house and the heating and for the water. I give them the bed. I give them all their clothes and things to eat. And bitch, how ungrateful they are. They should come and talk to me about forgiveness. <laughs> I'm laughing for what's coming up here in a minute. The Bible says, humble yourself and you'll be exalted. You can start mending fences and establishing or repairing broken fences and walls that have been erected in the home. But whatever you do, don't start by saying, yesterday when you made me so mad, walls went up, you can forget the rest of what you say because now you're blaming them for the problem. Now, they may be 85 or 90% wrong, but you're not going to deal with that. You're going to deal with your 15%. Yesterday, I responded badly. Now, when you do that, God is working on your behalf. Don't be surprised if you, at the good answers that you get back. I remember when I was, uh, well, a number of years ago now, my daughter, oldest daughter, is four years old. Her name's Lydia, and she is strong-willed. She works as a foreign affairs advisor for a Republican senator who just got reelected in Wisconsin. She goes all over the world uh, with him, and she advises him about what goes on in foreign policy in those countries. And um, Daniel and I, uh, you know, we just hit it off, and I'd say, Daniel, this is what we're going to do this morning. I'd get all the kids, and I'd say, Daniel, this is your job. Boom, 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 boom. Now, let's get it done. He'd go, okay, Dad. Boom. Off he went. So I said, Lydia, Lydia, this is your job. Boom, boom, boom. Now, let's get it. She just raised her head up like this and look at me. As if she was saying, well, I'll think about it and I'll let you know. <laughs> Four years old. And I said, sweetheart, did you hear me? She'd wait. And I'm, my t- you know, my anger is getting. Did she said, yes. I said, well, what's the problem? You just wait. Ooh, used to steam me. So I went to my wife and I said, I'm really having a problem with this and bomb, bomb, bomb. She should be doing this and this and this. And this. I'll never forget the words. Now, this is over 35 years ago. Here's what my wife told me. She said, which one of you is the adult? <laughs> She says, I don't have a problem with her. I said, well, what do you do? She told me, and I implemented, and I haven't had a problem since. Never 
forgot that little gentle rebuke. Which one of you is the adult? If you haven't spent quality time with them, as in my case, then admit it and tell them and that you're trying to do better. You could text them or call them with encouraging thoughts or wise sayings. Use scripture if it will help. If they rebel against any religious stuff, then use other wise sayings. Truths, there are a lot of truths that are, come from biblical truth anyway, but we don't have a biblical uh, verse attached to it. Tell them what God's doing in your life. Tell them what God <clears throat> is teaching you. By the way, I found that's one of the best um, tools in reaching, t talking with people. You meet somebody, you go, you know what? I'm learning some wonderful things. You know what God taught me this week? Most people would go, know what? Tell them what God's teaching you. That's a great little tool. Here's what I learned this week. Here's what God taught me. Now, if you have some carnal children, <laughs> we've all had them, then tell them God is changing you and changing your, your, your perspective on things and showing you how to be a better man or a better woman. You might even ask them, how can I be a better person to you? Write them a love letter, but be honest. Watch what you say because they may keep the letter for a long time. Amen. <laughs> Get your wife's input and use discretion. I wrote a letter to one of my sisters one time and for some things she did and she really hurt a lot of people. And so I wrote a letter and I it's a spot reader sent it and I thought, well, I'll ask my wife what she thinks. And so I gave it to her and she read it. And she said, Whew, that's way too harsh. You do well to rewrite that. And I go, really? And I said, I just told him, no, no, you need to rewrite that. So I, I, I rewrote it. And I toned it down and I said, okay. You know, so I submitted it and gave it to her again. I said, now, what do you think now? And she read it and she goes, you need to go work on it again. <laughs> she says, you're not speaking out of love. You're speaking out of anger. So I went back and I... Worked on it and worked on it, working that sentence. She goes, okay, you can send it now. Sometimes we just respond in anger and we cause a lot more problems when we need to drop back and pray about it and think about it. Let me just say this to you. Your words have an incredible impact as a parent. Incredible. Those of you who are encouragers and those of you who are not, Boy, your words make a great deal of difference. You see a child doing something good, commend them for it. I don't think I did enough of commending as a parent. Commend them for it. Do you realize the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue? You're creating death and life in your children by the power of your tongue, how you choose to use it. Thank them for taking the time to do a good job or thinking about you or calling. When you see or hear something they, they've done well, let them know. I saw you talking with so-and-so today and that was really nice about what you did or what you said to them. Tell them. It will help them. There's another thing. It's the sixth thing I mentioned. Appreciate them. By noticing them. The next thing is to spend some quality time with them. That may require some planning. I think we get so busy that with all the things we have going on and, and if you're like me and you wanted to go to the gym and you wanted to do this and you wanted to do that and you had to visit, the, you know, all these things that you do and when you walk in the door at night, sometimes you're exhausted. You don't want to spend any time. You want to say, leave me alone. 
spending some quality time with them, just listening to them. I counseled with a man for over a year and a half. He has three daughters. His wife left, and he's raising the three, and he has the best relationship with those three girls of any person I know. They come to him. They talk to him. They tell him about everything. When they're wrong, they, get, they ask for forgiveness. And I said, how did you do that? He said, well, when my wife left, they were all angry. So I decided just to listen to them without passing judgment. Jeff mentioned that in the, this morning. I just listened to them. Sometimes they needed a vent. If they asked for my opinion, then I gave it. Sometimes I asked them, do you want my opinion? And if they didn't, I didn't push it. But I listened to them talk. Accept your wife or your child as unique and totally different, not like anybody else. You know, even twins are different. They look the same, but they're different. 1 Corinthians 12, 6 says, God works through different people in different ways. I'm amazed at how, what's the best word to say? Confused men can be. I've listened to a lot of people in counseling, and so many times men are clueless. I thought I'd get an eighth men for some of you women out there. <laughs> I was when I went in, when I was first married, I was clueless. Now you think I would know something. I had four sisters, but I, man, but perspective is really amazing. You're looking at it for one perspective and she's looking at it for another. I love the man who was in the hospital. He was in the hospital bed, and he said to his wife, you've always been with me when I've been in trouble. When I lost my shirt and that poor investment, you were there. And when I had that car accident, you were with me. And when I got fired, you were there and comforted me. And when I got hurt in a skiing accident and ended up in the hospital here, you're with me. I've come to this conclusion, sweetheart. You're just plain bad luck. <laughs> Bad perspective. <laughs> Set aside some time to call your children and just listen. Let them talk. Ask your wife for advice and opinions. Recognize her mental, recognizing her mental ability and her talents. I found many times that um, wives are way more perceptive than men are. I knew my, I know my wife was. Tell her what you want, what you need, and what you feel. Tell your wife that. Don't assume that she knows, because they'll tell you she doesn't. And vice versa. The sooner you do that, the better. Sometimes that needs to be repeated. It does. I'm telling you something that's, man, there's some real wisdom. If you will get that done up front, you can talk about it and pray about it. Here comes the last one. We've talked about loving your spouse sacrificially, living a godly life. We've talked about listening skills. Now, uh, this one is on prayer. Pray for them continually. Jeff said the same thing this morning. Amen. James 5, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you have a wayward child and one has a lot of hangups and hurts and all that other stuff, enlist other people to pray for them. Get as many prayer warriors as you possibly can that won't gossip. You and your wife, pray for them together if you can. You might even ask the child, how can I pray for you? They may be willing to tell you, and they may, they may not be. Pray for them whenever you can in their presence. They may blush. They may think, mm, but they'll never forget it. They'll never forget you cared. Isn't it good that God's a God of the second chance? Maybe you've messed up big time and you have some trouble. You have some kids that are really troubled now or may, may be in trouble. 
I've got some tremendous news for you. Tremendous news. God can restore any home situation. Amen. Any. I was listening to a couple. I even advised the person to leave. I didn't think it would work. They'd tried and tried and tried and tried and through every by the means I, I knew possible. And I was, I threw up my hands. They're doing very well now. <laughs> I thought, well, they applied some biblical principles and they worked. It's amazing what God can do. But you got to be patient. It may take six months. It may take a year. It may take 10 years. It may take more. My aunt prayed for my cousin Wingate for 25 years for him to change. Convey to them that you have a desire to have a relationship with them, that that's very important to you. The question that comes so often is this, how long is it going to take? How long? You know how long we've been striving with this child? You know about what we've been through? The prophet asked Isaiah, I was writing, he said, Lord, how long? The nation's torn apart. The people are rebellious. They don't want to follow you. They've broken your covenants. They don't care. Everything's falling apart. How long do I have to keep doing this? And the answer was, as long as it takes as long as it takes. Whether it's your marriage or your children or your own personal life, remember this, how marvelous God's been to you in the past and that he's the God of the future. He will help you. Whatever transgressions or omissions that may have occurred, they can be forgiven and restored. He can make something beautiful out of the ashes of your life and bring some wonderful changes to your family. Will it be easy? No. Rarely is it really easy, but it can change. Be patient, give God time to work, and wait on him. And wait on him. That's the hard part. What did Jeff say this morning where it was a great testimony? My parents were consistent. They stayed at it, and they stayed at it, and they stayed at it. And I saw in them something that I wanted. As long as it takes. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that you are the God and the second chance and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the thousandth, and on it goes. And you've given us so many opportunities to come to you. And we thank you that we can come, and you want to hear from us. You desire to hear from us, and you want us to come with confidence. And it's not that you can't change the situation today. There's things that set in order that need to be, that need to be accomplished before certain things happen. And you're willing to wait as you've been willing to wait on us. So, Father, whether it's a marriage today, whether it's in, in our personal life, or whether it's in our children that we have at home, or children now that are away from our home, even those that are wayward, and they've chosen their own path, and it doesn't include God or the parents. Lord, I thank you that you work on our behalf. And I pray for those marriages, Lord. I pray, Lord, for those children as they're being raised. I pray, Lord, for those wayward ones that, Lord, you'd bring them to the end of themselves. We pray that you would do it as you normally do in your timetable and not in ours. But help us to be patient and keep on keeping on until you take us home. And we want to thank you for your wonderful grace and mercy to us. And Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that's been made available in Christ Jesus, that our sins could all be taken away. And instead of our sins that you look at, you look at the righteousness of Christ because we're dressed in his righteousness. God, how we thank you for that, that he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful truth. And we thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Our invitation is this. Maybe today you have a child or maybe you, have just, you want to pray for your children. You'll just come to the front and say, you know what? I want to pray for my children today. You can join me at the front because I'm praying for mine. Maybe today you have something in your personal life you just need to pray about. And said, you know what? hadn't changed yet, but praise God, there's hope. Amen. Maybe it's a wayward child or maybe wayward children. And you just like to come and pray for them. And I, I just invite you to come to the front. Come to the front and let's pray for them.